We welcome everybody into our Sunday evening Bible study for a rainy Sunday afternoon to wrap up the month of January. We're glad you joined us if you joined us online and glad for the handful of folks we've got here that braved the, the wet weather coming down from the sky to join us here in the sanctuary tonight. But uh, we're going to start off with a word of prayer and then we'll get into Acts chapter 19, second half of the chapter and see where we go from there. Father God, we thank you this evening, Father, for all that you do, uh, Father, that shows your love to us. God, you are faithful and you are constant in how you love us. And Father God, we don't even understand the half of it, but everything we do understand, Father, we know you are worthy of our praise because of your lovingness. Lord God, thank you that you not only show us that love, but you teach us how to experience it and how to share it ourselves with others. And Father, to be a part of the kingdom that you have established and that you are over, Father and Lord, that will be and is indeed victorious. So Father God, help us to do that. We thank you that we can join into your kingdom and serve in your kingdom by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and following him daily in our lives. So Lord, help us to do that. Father God, certainly along the way, we all, as we stand in and for Christ, will uh, we'll, we'll come up against folks who don't understand that, who don't like that, who attack that, just as we'll read about and study this evening. Lord God, would you help us to be faithful in that, to not, not to uh, rise up, not to attack back, not to sink to the level of tactics that sometimes people sink to, but rather to continue to, to shine your love brightly in this dark world. And Father, would you work in and through that faithfulness and in that love, Lord, that we might be able to see you continue to save souls and change lives. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so Acts chapter 19, uh, we've been, uh, been looking at that here for just a little, uh, well, the last week and this week, so just a little while, but we, uh, we see that Paul is back in Ephesus and there's some things going on uh, there. He's ministering, he's, uh, he's teaching people about the Holy Spirit as we talked about last week. A um, lot, of, lot of different theological ideas amongst denominations and amongst, uh, within the Christian faith have come from the first half of chapter 19. The second half of chapter 19, you've probably got as a title in your copy of the Word, something to the effect of a riot in Ephesus or the riot in Ephesus uh, or Ephesus riots or however they might put it in your particular copy and translation of God's Word there. But uh, inevitably, uh, opposition comes. Now remember what's happening here before we read this part of the passage that um, when Paul or any Christian in that time and in that area of the world, when they would enter a, into a city uh, or a town or a village, oftentimes, uh, if not always, there would be a patron god in, in whatever different faith uh, of that city. Certainly amongst the Greek and the Roman gods, uh, you would have here um, in a city the size of Ephesus, you would have one or more than one particular god or goddess that they worshipped. And usually that would have to do with which gods and goddesses had temples built to them in those areas. And as we'll see here in the, in the passage we'll study in just a moment, we see that, uh, that, that there was an event that happened, and we don't go too deep, we won't go too deep into that this evening other than just to know that things would happen at certain places in the ancient world, and they would ascribe those happenings to whatever God they believed in. And it didn't have to be a Greek or a Roman God. Uh, it could have been a, a pagan God, could have been all kinds of different gods that they worshipped. Uh, and then they would, much like the people of Israel did, uh, they would, when something happened that they attributed to or understood came from their God or goddess, they'd build an altar there. They'd build a temple there. And then the worship of that God or goddess would begin to grow and they'd keep going. And, and in bigger cities, you'd have, just like it is today, if a, if a business is successful and opens in a big city, it gets bigger and bigger. And then you start to see little outcroppings and franchises and other things happen. The same thing happened in temple worship of these other gods and goddesses. And so we're going to run into a problem here of where when the message of Christ comes into those cities and inevitably people believe as they do and as we, uh, as we rejoice in, as we read through the book of Acts, more and more people are receiving the gift of salvation by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. Well, that means that they have to do something specific and that specific thing is stop worshiping these other gods. And temple worship of these gods was not just a religious activity, it was big business. And, uh, and we're going to see here in just a minute how it impacts 
uh, some of the, the, the business owners, the tradesmen uh, around the temple there at Ephesus. And so uh, when that happens, all of a sudden, if there's less people worshiping that god or goddess, that means there's less people needing idols. There's less people needing sacrifices. There's less people needing this and that. And all of those businesses that served and catered to and made their money off of those worshipers start to lose money. Uh, they start to lose livelihood. They start to lose interest and start to lose success. And that, of course, rubs those people the wrong way. And before we get too down on the, the people that we're going to read about, Demetrius and the others that we'll read about here in this passage, um, this, this happens in other areas, right? It doesn't have to be because of temple worship going down. I mean, when a, when a city uh, or a town has... Uh, you know, has always had kind of mom and pop stores and some other store comes in, a Walmart or, you know, uh, uh, you know any, any other type of thing. Or they've had little mom and pop's restaurants and McDonald's pops up on the corner or another, you know, big chain restaurant comes in. There's always this, this grassroots opposition to it. Now, it probably doesn't get to the point of what we're going to read about today, but that's exactly the, the, the tone of what's going on here. Um, yes, it is people who don't know Christ attacking and wanting to attack even more, in this case, uh, those that do know Christ and who do worship Jesus, um, and, and who even, even the Jews, even the ones that don't, don't profess the name of Jesus, the ones who simply worship Jehovah God, they, they're, they're against them as well, right? Uh, so the, but it's that same tone. So, so as you read this, I think it's helpful as I read it simply to identify a little bit with both sides. First off, we have the people who are sharing Christ, the people who worship God to the best of their ability, even including the Jews who we know have problems with how they experience Jesus from a Christian perspective. But here again, I understand where they're coming from. I don't agree with it. I don't think it's okay, especially some of the tactics they use, as well as some of these tradesmen's tactics that, the, that we're going to get into. Uh, but I get it. I can see it. I mean, I understand it because um, here it is. There's something new in town that is a threat. There's something new in town that seems to be, whether it's overt or covert, whether it's out in the open or whether it's just implied, seems to be attacking their way of life. So with that said, it says here in, um, in Acts chapter 19, uh, starting with verse 23, we read this. It says, about that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. And he called them together, along with the workers in related trades, and said, you know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. And you see in here how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. And even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. And the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing and some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. And the Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front, and they shouted instructions to him. And he motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, great as Artemis of the Ephesians. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image, which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. 
As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. And after he had said this, he dismissed the, the assembly. All right, we have a very public, very large, very growing, very volatile uh, brouhaha going, up on, going on in Ephesus, right? This is, uh, this is dangerous, uh, could be even more dangerous than it ends up being. Uh, certainly has the potential to have all types of repercussions here in the city of Ephesus and for the people who live there as well as the people who, uh, like Paul, uh, have, have come there for quite some time and who are ministering there as missionaries. Uh, we see in verse 23, and this is interesting, uh, I don't know how many Star Wars fans are watching or in here, but it's always funny, it says about that time there arose a great disturbance about the way, if you've seen Star Wars, a great disturbance in the force, right? Uh, the way, of course, you remember is, is what uh, the, the movement of believers in Christ was being called in this area at this time. Uh, and that's why it's capitalized in your Bible. So the way is the Christian church, the church at Ephesus in this particular case specifically. <clears throat> so, but there arose a great disturbance. This is, this is Luke's uh, introductory statement to say, hey, and then there was a problem. That's, that's all that this is here. Uh, in verse 24, it says a silversmith, and then we're introduced to a man named Demetrius. He's a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, and he brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. Um, now, you would have had, as, as we mentioned in our introduction, we, we talked about how you'd have the silversmiths uh, like Demetrius who would actually, who would actually make and, 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 and you know, mold the, uh, you know, the idols that were used in the worship of Artemis. But you also had other people who would raise and sell the livestock and the other items needed for the sacrifices and things like that. Um, think about it this way. So if, if worship of Artemis was the Nissan plant in Canton, Right, we know years ago when the Nissan plant in Canton, in Mississippi, opened up. Um, you know, it wasn't just that there was going to be this huge Nissan plant that would stretch for a mile or more, you know, of a building there on the side of I-55. But what else would happen? It would be all the other jobs, all the other businesses, tires and part manufacturers and things like that that would need to be close by that would pop up. And certainly they have, right? Uh, and so, so this is kind of the idea. This is just the way business works. If you've been in the business world, you know it better than I do. Uh, but this is the way it works, that one big anchor business supports a lot of other businesses around it and in and around that area, and, and it makes up a, a local economy. And that's what's going on here. So uh, Artemis uh, is worshipped by all of these people that don't, don't only live in Ephesus, but come to Ephesus to worship her. Um, and, uh, and, and they do that, and they need things. Uh, you also have people who would, I'm sure would come to stay. So you even have things in the hospitality industry, inns and uh, guest houses and so to speak that, would, that, that people would stay in to come. And, and so you have a large bit of the local economy in Ephesus centered around and dependent upon the worship of this, of this goddess Artemis. Um, so Demetrius is uh, one who apparently they would listen to. Uh, we don't know if he is like the chief of all silversmiths or uh, we don't even know really uh, we get some hints that maybe he also worships Artemis, but we don't really get the idea fully or, or you know, to, to drive the point fully home that, that, he, that this is even a religious dispute. Because what does he say to him? In verse 25, it says, He called them together along with the workers and related trades and said, You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. Is he attacking the Christians? Is he attacking Paul specifically by name, as he mentions him in a moment, uh, on a spiritual basis? No. It's simply, it's eating into their bottom line. It's eating into their profits, into the success of their business, it's taking food off of their table. And that's where, at least based on what Luke tells us here, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, when we read in the text, this was the motivation for Demetrius. And it's interesting because certainly what would happen amongst a bunch of silversmiths? Silversmiths are tradesmen, but in this case, they would also probably be considered pretty highly as artists, wouldn't they? Um, and when you have artists, it's not like Artemis dropped a mold for a silver idol down from 
you know, Mount Olympus to Ephesus and said, here, make these and mass produce them. These were competitors of Demetrius's, right? I mean, some of them were worked in different trades, so they weren't direct competitors, but he had some direct competitors in there. And so we see from the outset that Demetrius's language maybe is a little bit contrived. Maybe it's a little bit more than what he would have normally said on a regular day, but because he has this ax to grind, because he has this agenda, because his, his wallet it's being hurt in this. Um, he, he all of a sudden makes nice with everybody who could be a potential ally. We see this throughout uh, the book of Acts. We see this throughout life, don't we? That when, when someone is threatened by a, a, an organization, a business, a person, a church, a, a belief or whatever, what do they do? They look amongst those who might not would always already be their allies to make allies so that they feel stronger in the attack of this whatever thing that they feel like they need to attack. That's exactly what Demetrius does here. He says, my friend, Friends, you know we make a great income. He appeals to them on the basis of money, the basis of greed, or as we call it today, capitalism, right? Uh, this is, you know, hey, we can make as much money as we can make, which meant they could charge as much for those idols and those you know, objects uh, for, for sacrifice and, and, and for the, the paraphernalia that went with it, they could charge as much as, the, as people would pay, and so they'd make good money, right? That's capitalism at its best in that situation. Um, I'm not against capitalism, by the way, but capitalism does have at its very core more, right? That's just the idea. Uh, so here we go. We've got these guys here in Ephesus that are dealing with that same uh, basic understanding. Verse 26, he continues after talking about them making such a great income. He says, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. That one sentence right there, is both true and embellishment all at the same in the same words, right? What does he do? He says, hey, this fellow Paul, he starts very specifically. He says, this fellow Paul has convinced, which seems somewhat less grievous, but then what's the next words? He's convinced them and then led them astray. He's convinced them of something, and now Demetrius is casting aspersions on that, right? He's, he's talking about it in a negative way right off the bat, but it's increasing, it's, it's, it's accelerating here. So this, this fellow Paul specifically is, is taking some of our people, he's convincing them of things, leading them astray, telling them these wrong ideas, and he says large numbers of people are doing that. Right, so the, the, it amplifies even more. Um, the, the large people, large numbers of people here in Ephesus, and now here's the exaggeration part, although it's got some basis in reality, and practically the whole place, right, the whole province. I mean, you know, everybody's dealing with this, and and now we know from previous verses that we've studied in previous weeks, we know that. The word of Jesus was, the gospel was going through the whole province of Asia and people were putting their faith in Jesus. So he's right, it is happening, but you can almost hear in his, in his words how, oh man, this is going to take over our whole world, right? Again, somewhat based in truth. It was, that was what was going on. The gospel was spreading throughout that whole part of the world and then eventually into all the world as it still continues to spread. But you hear from his point of view, he's starting with something specific and working into generalities so that he can, uh, he can prove his point, gain his allies, make his attack, and be successful in you know, recouping whatever type of uh, you know, uh, punishment towards the people who have offended and, and whatever type of you know, remuneration he might think that he's entitled to along with the rest of the tradesmen. Uh, so it says here, uh, you know, he's doing that throughout the whole province of Asia. He says, he says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. Now, at this point, with amongst these tradesmen, whether Demetrius is a big worshiper of Artemis or not, you got to believe that there's going to be some that are worshipers of Artemis or some that might worship another god or another goddess but are into idol worship. So now he takes it up instead of just specifically about the money that they're losing right here. He's now talking about the, the spiritual issue. And now he's talking about that. He says you can't even use idols at all. That's a big no-no according to his God. You, you 
you feel how he's ramping it up, ratcheting it up, and just kind of, you know, it starts off very specific, and now all of a sudden, and by the way, he's the devil, you know, like he's just, he's kind of, it's, it's that way that, that we do, as I won't say that people do, that we do as people, um, and yeah, and, and you know what, that day they did this, and then, you know, they also do this, and you know, you know what, they're just terrible people, right? We just kind of work in that direction. That's where negativity, uh, you know, can go. That's, when they, that's where attacks go when it's a righteous attack. It's where attacks go and how attacks go when it's not a righteous attack. It's just the nature of the way, as people, we confront and attack when we participate in this type of thing. Um, so he says in verse 27, there's danger not only to our, that our trade will lose its good name, so not only just to us and our families, and now he gets real spiritual all of a sudden. But also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world will be robbed of her divine majesty. Anybody catch the problem in this argument? Let me, let me bring it to you this way. Think about it like this. We well, you know our kids should be able to pray in school. Because when they don't, can't pray in school, that a lot of them aren't going to learn and know about God. And then all of a sudden they're going to do all these things. And our schools are going to be crazy places, whether they're public or private or charter or whatever type of school they are. Uh, you know, sin and, and, and wildness and wickedness is going to run rampant. And, and, and all of a sudden we won't have a God of this country at all. Sound familiar? Now, here's where the problem is. Does how America worships, worship God have anything at all to do with God's true, real deity? Nope. Every worshiper in America could fall off the face of the earth tonight. Hopefully not. But we could, and God would still be God. What does he say about Artemis? That look, not only are we going to lose money, but the worship of her uh, is, going to be, is going to be messed up all over the world. And his words, she will be robbed of her divine majesty. Interesting. Now, we could say those same things about America. And, and, and I'm not discounting the problem of not allowing kids and teachers and families to have prayer in school. I'm adamantly for that, Right? But I'm not for that because it's going gonna, it's gonna to take away God's divinity. It's, it's going to make God less God, right? Now, it'll make America less godly, and it has, and it's continuing to. But that's said a different way, isn't it? You say, oh, well, those are just words. Well, no, it, it reveals a philosophy. It reveals a belief. Now, we can absolutely say that if there's not prayer in schools that Christianity, not the God of Christianity, but Christianity will suffer in America, and we'll lose its saltiness, if you want to use a scriptural term, or lose its power, lose its influence, because at a grassroots level in the schools where kids learn how to be people um, in a lot of ways, if God's not present in that, it will trickle up in that situation, and it will have an impact on the power of Christians, the influence of Christians in our country. But do you see the difference? That's a big difference. And for the, the, the ones who were upset about the movement for Christ in Ephesus, it kind of shows that they know. They know a little bit about their God. Is it possible that this is just the vernacular they used, the words that they decided to speak that same idea? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't get so literally tied to just the simple words that are translated into English to here to where we can know every bit of their heart. But I believe that, that this is just an underlying principle that shows that these other gods were dependent on people to keep them gods, to keep their relevance. And that's what was in, they were, thought they were in danger of losing at this point was people aren't believing anymore. It kind of goes back to, um, you know, the movies and the stories we've read and watched about Santa Claus. And if people stop believing that Santa Claus won't be real. Sorry, Steve. Uh, you know, <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, I'm still believing, so you still hear me. But you know, right, that's the storyline of a lot, of, especially in some of the more modern movies, right? You know, and, and, and the modern stories. Uh, that, that, you know, if, if there's not enough children believing that, you know, the North Pole loses lights or something, I don't know, whatever they do. Uh, yeah, that's right, there's no, yeah, exactly. And so uh, that is a, that's a pagan God worship 
philosophy, right? Now I'm not I'm not downing the Christmas movies. Love Polar Express, right? <laughs> Weird animation, but whatever. Uh, different story for a different time. But but you know that but that's that again is a is something that's in our entertainment that's built on a philosophy that's been popular throughout our world and and for a long time. God is under no such strictures. God is under no such need. We I think we can take a uh, look at this for a second. It doesn't matter if our church and every church like ours closes their doors today. God's still God. He's not robbed of his majesty. We're simply robbed of our experience with him and our obedience to him. But that's how that's the appeal that we've just heard from, from Demetrius to these tradespeople. Hey, it's hurting our pocketbooks. Um, and if we're not careful, if we let this go, it's going to bring calamity to all that we know and love. And in fact, it'll make Artemis not even as much of a goddess as we thought her to be or that we needed her to be to keep making a dime off of her. Verse 28 says, uh, when they heard this, they were furious as they would be. And again, that ramped up, ratcheted up, accelerated fury. That you could almost see him inciting that crowd of, of people. Uh, when they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. We get the understanding that this is possibly something that they would have shouted as a part of the practice of worship. Uh, but, but, you know, they could have been chanting SEC or USA. You know, they, 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 that the crowd was incited enough to where now it's kind of spread from Demetrius' issue to now it's a big problem in that crowd at that time. And things are going to start to get dangerous. Verse 29, they do. It says, soon the whole city was in an uproar. That's not good for a city, by the way. Um, you know, they, they pick on Philadelphia, and if Philadelphia's about to go to the Super Bowl, and if they indeed win the Super Bowl, Philadelphia, as Philadelphians would say, is probably going to burn in a lot of areas, right? Uh, people do that in success for their countries, for their cities, for their states, whatever, you know, for their teams, for their people. Uh, that they, they riot, but this is a riot trying to attack, uh, you know, uh, uh, fire back against an attack against them as they perceived it. So the whole city's in an uproar. It says the people sees Gaius and Aristarchus. They are now looking for people who are associated with Paul. They find these two men who are from Macedonia, um, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Now think of the theater as like an amphitheater type of area. It's a large public meeting place where they would have met for not only entertainment, but they also would have met for civic uh, situations similar to this. That would have been where they went. So they rush into the theater. And in verses 30 and 31, we get, a, you know, we, we get our only mention other than Demetrius bringing his name up in this passage of Paul. Uh, what is Paul doing during all this? Two of his close companions, two of his fellow ministers, two of his fellow minister, missionaries have been taken by the crowd and brought into this theater. It's not looking good. It's dangerous. It says in verse 30, it says, Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples were not letting the church, not the 12 disciples, the, the church, right? The, the church at Ephesus says, this is not a good idea. Is this, um, is this the, the, the church at Ephesus being cowardly? Is this the church at Ephesus being, you know, overly careful? Um, maybe <laughs> a little bit. Um, regardless, we hope, based on what they've done up to this point, that we, we hope that the understanding here is that the Spirit is telling them, no, it's not time for Paul to go make a public stand. Not here, not right now. We know, reading through the book, rest of the book of Acts, as, as well as knowing about the epistles that Paul will write in future, you know, in, in the future of this time, um, that if they kill Paul here, it, it will mean God will have to raise somebody else up. And they very likely would have uh, potentially killed Paul had he made an, uh, a, a, you know, a, an appearance there. And that doesn't mean that there's not times where in the, the standing for Christ that people don't need to take that type of public stand. It's not saying that this is how you should. Again, it's not a normative thing like we've talked about here recently. Uh, in this instance, though, the, the Holy Spirit, we believe, led the church at Ephesus to say, Paul, now is not the right time. You know, you know, Paul wanted to go. Paul was not being cowardly. However, he, as always, was submitting to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it says there in verse 31, even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. Now, at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the passage that we've read, and as we finish it up here in just a few moments, um, there could be also another reason why these local officials, as well as the church, didn't want Paul to go there. Because uh, what's happening here is, is, some, is the type of thing that quickly gets on the radar of the Roman Empire. 
Um, and we've talked about that throughout the book of Acts, that much of the time, uh, on a personal level, it had to do with what was being taught and preached. Uh, but on a civic level, on a governmental level, it was simply just, let's make sure that the Roman Empire doesn't send the army back in and crush us all over again and take away what freedom we have. And so they tolerated, they dealt with, they, they let slide here and did this and that uh, to try to keep the peace, so to speak, at least from the empire level of things. Uh, remember, the Roman Empire didn't care so much about the day-to-day -day operations within the empire in these outlying areas. Of course, we're getting closer and closer to Rome, but Ephesus would still be considered an outlying area um, and, and an outlying province. Uh, they didn't care so much about the day-to-day. -day. They wanted to make sure that two things happened, that their taxes kept coming in, right, to support Rome, support Caesar, uh, and that the idea that, that, that Caesar was the most powerful force in the universe was still being enforced. Um, well, what happens as Christianity, or for that matter, any other faith spread and grew in popularity? Well, certainly with Christianity, we see the problem with Caesar being the most powerful person in the universe, right? Uh, that's a problem that's absolutely preached against in the gospel. Uh, but then also, too, we see that it meant they would do something different with their money, which might mean the law. So the potential of being a problem was there, but it didn't, you know, it took a lot to get there. And one of the, one of the parts of a lot that it would take to get there is what would have happened if Paul would have walked into that theater. And that is a murderous riot, an uproar that cost lives. Well, we also know that Paul is a Roman citizen, <laughs> so that would have made it even worse. And he's a Jew and he's a Christian. And so this was, this, was a, this was a powder keg, right? And that plays into it here in the, in the last part of, the, of this passage. So the officials said, uh, in agreement with the church, for maybe the same, maybe different reasons, uh, Paul, don't go in there. Verse 32, flashback to the assembly itself, says the assembly was in confusion. You know that sense in a crowd like this that, man, it's just there's excitement, there's agitation, there's anger, there's passion, there's all these things that are going on in this crowd and it becomes like a wave that people get caught up in. And at some point, inevitably, what will happen is, is that that'll die down and people look around and go, what are we doing, right? That happens to all of us. We get caught up in the moment. It says the assembly in verse 32 was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. And here's what we find out. Most of the people didn't even know what they were, why they were there. It was what the city was doing at the time. It was the crowd. It was that, that, um, you know, that, that adrenaline rush that was going on. And that, yeah, Artemis of the Ephesians, Artemis of the Ephesians. Um, it, it was a bad scene. It was dangerous. It was, it was uh, dangerous not only to Paul, but it was dangerous to the people in the crowd, people who lived in and around that part of the city, and all kinds of other folks. Um, it says in verse 33, the Jews in the crowd push Alexander to the front in the midst of all this confusion and all this adrenaline rush, um, and they shouted instructions to him as, as one of their respected leaders. Uh, it says he motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the crowd, but before he can even make his defense, because again, what are the Jewish elders worried about they might be saying yeah let's get paul because they're kind of against this whole spread of christianity thing too the way is not a popular group of people with them either because it's influencing their uh their power and their standing uh so but but even they are you know we, we believe that the, the, the defense that alexander would have made had the crowd given him time would have been hey guys whoa we don't need to go too far or else none of us will be able to worship the way we want to worship right uh, so it's a very self-serving set of purposes here amongst this crowd. Uh, so, but it says in verse 34, when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, great as Artemis of the Ephesians. Great as Artemis of the Ephesians. Um, why did they care? Well, because he wasn't going to help them worship Artemis either, <laughs> you know. Um, and so you have all these different things. It says in verse 35, we finally get some some semblance of, of order to come back. Uh, the crowd quiets down for just a moment enough to hear the city clerk. Now, who would the city clerk have been? Uh, very likely an appointed position, uh, probably someone from that city who had 
uh, who cared about the city, not some transplant from Rome, but someone who was amongst his people that didn't want anything worse to happen for his city. So you've got all these different allegiances, Demetrius to his wallet and to his business and to the other tradesmen, the worshipers of Artemis to the other worshipers of Artemis, uh, the Jews to the Jews, and now this person, this man who represents the city um, and, and the well-being of the city of Ephesus is the one who finally gets to speak in a way that turns, uh, it turns the, you know, stems the tide of what's going on. He says, fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great, Ar- great Artemis um, and of her image which fell from heaven? That's that event that, that set up the worship of Artemis there. We don't have time to get into the specifics of that. That's just kind of interesting reading if you want to Google that. Um, but he says, look, doesn't everyone know we worship Artemis? I mean, this is, this is one of the things we're largely and widely known for. He says, therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. He speaks up and says, hey, look, it's not, uh, he, he's saying we are who we are. This thing's not going to destroy who we are. Was that the purpose of the gospel, was to destroy who Ephesus was? Uh, you could kind of talk about it in that direction, but that wasn't the immediate impact that the gospel was making, right? It was to save people. Uh, and, and it was a, a good thing that God was doing there, but how, it's in, how it is you know, received by the people and how they experienced it was, was what was at issue here. Uh, but he says, look, we're still going to be a city who is revered for the name of Artemis. So he's kind of combating what Demetrius has said, saying, he's saying, look, it's going to be fine. Don't do anything we can't walk back from. Don't cross a line that we can't uncross. And, uh, and he says to it says, um, verse 37, he says, you've brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. So um, he says, look, they've not broken any laws that we're right to do such as we're doing for. I mean, we're not... They've not, if they were breaking down the temple walls of the temple of Artemis, or if they were desecrating that temple, okay, we could, we could see this because we can defend that. But what you're saying and what we're, what the basis for gathering it together, we can't defend this. They've not robbed the temples. They're not desecrated anything. They're not blaspheming the goddess specifically. Um, he's like, so look, we have no legal grounds here within our context. Um, he says, if then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. So he's saying, look, there's a procedure. If you believe that they've, you know, that this movement, the way has injured your livelihood, there was a way to bring charges. There was a way to sue. There was a way to uh, bring them before the, the courts and have them censored or, 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 you know, or dismissed or, or uh, exiled from the area or to have something, you know, um, prohibited by local law. That was a possibility, but that wasn't what the crowd was going about, right? That wasn't going to be quick enough for them because they, they had been hyped up on all these charges and all this, uh, you know, all this, this fanfare that went on trying to get them incited into attacking. In verse 39, it says, if there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. Verses 40 and 41, it says, as it is, we're in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we should not be able to, uh, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. He appeals to them on a very basic legal uh, basis. He, he simply says to them, y'all, this is not the way to do this. Um, we're going to get ourselves in more trouble than the way ever caused for us up to that point. And it says then after he, said, he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. So we get here that, that we don't have any bloodshed, although we have a, a day where lots of thing, lots of dust-ups are going on, and one big dust-up that has a lot of dust-up amongst it uh, happens in Ephesus, and the city clerk comes, and uh, um, thankfully, you know, for the people there at the moment, uh, common sense prevails, and they dismiss and they go home. Um, look at the basis of this whole thing. So first off, Demetrius starts the issue because of his money. Different people then start to get in based on their beliefs and it, and, it, and it grows and it accelerates. Finally, it's brought down by, hey, look, if we don't want to lose more than we're already losing, then let's calm down. And they do. Their sense of desire for freedom 
um, and desire for remaining freedom and, and fear of losing freedom overrides their willingness to stand for the goddess that they worship. Now, it's, it's common here when this passage is taught and preached, in my experience, it's common here to see, to make the par- comparison to say and see, that shows that that goddess Artemis was no goddess at all. Her, her people could be quieted down by just losing their freedom, but people lose their freedom all the time for the name of Christ. That point is in there. Uh, that point is one that is interesting and is maybe even helpful if the Spirit leads us to that. Um, I think the larger point that I get from this part of chapter 19 and this part of the book of Acts and this part of Scripture is this, is that... Um, when we deal with the truth of the gospel, it impacts all kinds of people in all kinds of different ways. And even as we do, uh, do share the gospel, teach the gospel, live the gospel in a faithful way and in faithful ways, um, different people are going to react differently. Um, sometimes common sense will prevail. The, the assembly will be dismissed and people will go back to their homes and live to fight another day, so to speak. Sometimes common sense won't prevail and terrible things will happen. But it's because people are going to respond to the gospel a lot of different ways. At no point did they tell Paul, hey, stop sharing the gospel. We can't stop sharing the gospel, living the gospel either, because of simply how it makes people react. And, and we, I believe, as people who want to honor the name of Christ, we don't need to engage in the same tactics We don't need to incite our own riots, so to speak, um, on behalf of God. God doesn't need us to stand up for him not one little bit. (laughs) He can stand just fine for himself. In fact, he would probably look at us and say, hey, instead of getting up in arms against that brother or that sister or that person over there, uh, why don't you get up in arms over your own stuff that's keeping you from following me, and then we'll worry about what's keeping them from following me. If God was going to really speak in that way, and maybe he does, uh, that, I think that's closer to how he would speak to us uh, when we're tempted to maybe say, hey, yeah, and this person, these people, this group, this movement, this philosophy in our country, in our world, uh, we need to stand against it and tear it down. They don't need to be able to do it. All the stuff that still happens today, even amongst Christians. We need to simply put our hands back to the plow. We need to put our heads down. Uh, we need to pin our ears back, whatever phrase you want to use, and keep sharing and living the gospel. And let God take care of his own name. Let God take care of his own defense. Let God take care of anything that's going to happen that's more than a show of of love as we understand it. Let's follow God in what he, we know he's told us to do and let him handle the different reactions. Let's keep sharing the gospel. And that's what he calls us to do. And that's what we come out of Acts chapter 19, I believe, being taught is that it's all still about sharing the gospel. Because guess what's going to happen in Acts 19, uh, at the end of that, excuse me, at the beginning of Acts 20, after Acts 19, Paul's going to go on and share the gospel some more. <laughs> it's, he's not going to slow down. He's not going to stop. He's not going to change. He's going to, he's going to keep sharing the gospel, as we should too. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we wrap up. Father God, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you that there is a gospel to share, that you have taught us, revealed to us, and exposed us to the power of your word that is the gospel that tells us, Father God, that, that we on our own are sinners bound for a devil's hell, But Father God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the acts of your mercy and your grace, Lord, we can be made whole again. We can be forgiven of our sin. And we can come in to be co-heirs with Christ, children of the one and only true God. And Father God, that is you. And Lord, in doing so, we can receive the gospel and learn to live it out and share it with others that they may be able to do the same. Help us, Father, to be a part of that glorious ministry. And Lord, thank you for the times that we have been and the times that you will allow us to be part of that ministry going forward. Let us be faithful and obedient to you in every way you call us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.